I live an hour outside of Albany, so mm. I could have gone to see Kalen Clark, but it like was like five hundred dollar get in price for the first couple of games, and then the LSU five hundred dollars. Yeah, the, L- the LSU game was oh, out. Yeah, the get in price was outrageous. Just gonna tell you, um, I I did consider my dad and I were like, you know, Kalen Clark's like only an hour. We should definitely go, and we're like, uh. All right. Well, maybe not. Those are a little. Those are a little steep. That's like, a that's an unfortunate but good sign that women's college basketball is doing pretty well if they're playing in Albany and they're still selling tickets for that insane of a price. So Celtics League is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. What's up, everyone? Welcome to a new edition of Celtics Beat. The regular season, it is winding down. We have only a half dozen games remaining before the playoffs begin. My goodness. Thank God. Thank God. I don't want to say we're running out of things to talk about with this team because there are things to talk about. But, you know, I think you can make the case they're running out of important things to talk about. You know, it it all becomes much more relevant, much more magnified, obviously, when we get to the postseason. Celtics are riding a three-game winning streak, all by double figures, most recently the absolute curb stomping of the OKC Thunder and the uh, the hometown kid, Mark Dagnall, on the other side. Now, granted, OKC, incredibly short, no SGA, no J-Dub. Celtics at full strength for what feels like a, a rarity these days. They've been load managing guys left and right, but everyone of note out there in Boston obviously responded, a commanding win. So, Let's talk a little bit about that, what's been going on, what is to come going forward. Jared Weiss here from The Athletic. Of course, Evan Valenti is here. I am Adam Kaufman. Welcome in. Boys, good to see you. Jared, what's going on? Just enjoying another Celtics game where it's like a two-possession game, and then I look up, and all of a sudden, they're up by 30. I don't know how that happens. It is wild, too, because, you know, like from a betting perspective, I – so I looked at it the night before. I see the line at, at Celtics by eight. I'm going, I don't know. I mean, I, I think SGA, J-Dub, I think these guys are going to be back. I know it's the second end of the back-to-back, but they didn't play the night before. It's a bigger game. It's, you know, more notoriety playing in Boston. It seemed like they could have gone that night before, but didn't precautionary. I think they're going to play. I'm going to stay away from that line. Those guys get ruled out midday. I pounced on Boston nine and a half and, you know, grew to, I don't know, 11, 11 and a half by the time the the game actually tipped off. And going back through that game, Boston was largely in front throughout. And then to your point, you know, it's, it's a, it's a mostly a, a single digit game for a while. And then like mid third quarter, you sort of just, you know, blink, snap your fingers, whatever. And Boston finishes the game on what a 40 to 12 run or whatever it was. And, and just won that thing going away we've been having a lot of talk on, on this, a lot of conversation on this show of late Jared last couple of weeks about closing out games. Now it doesn't really apply to last night. This isn't one of those, you know, crunch time minutes, five point game or less in the final five minutes, Boston again, blue doors to end this game. But when you see them a little bit earlier on, obviously respond in that way, you know, put a stranglehold on the thing. Don't let up. Don't take your foot off the gas. Just close this game. Does it give you any more confidence in their ability to win some of those close ones down the stretch that have maybe caused fans a little bit of uncertainty of late? No, because (laughs) we're game 75, six into the season. They've been doing this for six months now, five months, whatever it is. They've been doing it long enough. This was not nothing new. Also, just no no real challengers from OKC, like the two offensive stars of that team. So I wouldn't take anything from this game. But I would just say that there's not you don't need to poke holes at this point. I think their body of work is pretty solidified. This point of the season, just like not really reflective of how things are going to be. Um, I think I think that Atlanta series probably made it pretty clear. Um, like they, they're fine they're good um the, you know the questions with them are just more about how does the team fare over the course of a series against them when they get a feel for how the celtics play and does the celtic style does it lose it does it lose its edge when they're not just getting a team that's like just coming from playing another team and they're getting used to them you know i think it's gonna it's probably going to flatten that gap like that massive statistical gap that they have over the rest of the league but i don't think it's going to really change much i think they're the best team and they're going to have they're going to have control against pretty much any team they play besides denver 
And if they have, you know, it's not just, oh, they're the best team. Like, we feel like they're the best team. They're the deepest, the most talented, when healthy, all of this stuff. They have literally clinched the best record in the NBA. So no matter what happens going forward, they have that. They We were talking with Greeny, Barstool Greeny, Dan Greenberg, when he was on with us a few weeks back about that whole 60-20 thing. Well, they are now 60 and 16, so they've hit the 60 wins before 20 losses. Who knows? Maybe won't even get to 20 losses. How nice would that be? But also, I heard this on, on the broadcast last night, and I don't remember exactly the number, but I it was something to – Jared, you'd probably know. It was something to the effect, though, of Boston now has the most 25-plus point wins in a single season in NBA history, I think it is. So it's just all of these blowouts, like you said, they've – they've this is not new. They've been doing a lot of this ebb. So, you know, you you tell me. I mean, does it – alter your thinking about this team at all or do you look at it and say all right you know shorthanded thunder team on the other side yeah they've done this to a bunch of teams none of this really matters until we see what they can do against what we deem inferior competition in the postseason well i'll tell you the fact that they only have three losses at home is a big deal for me you know this is a team that really stunk at home in the playoffs last year to an annoying point right i mean philadelphia that was just not fun to watch on your home floor. Miami comes in, does the same thing, and it's like, all right, well, this is supposed to be easier at home, not harder. The Celtics are literally making this harder on themselves in order to try to get back to the NBA Finals, as we all know came a little bit short. But I do like the fact that they've held court at home, with the exception of three games, and they haven't really been tough. There's the L.A. Lakers loss, which is annoying because LeBron and AD were not in that game. There's the Nuggets game that obviously – the two point loss and you could point to literally any time in that game where, you know, I forget was who was shooting free throws, but they had three offensive rebounds in that possession towards the end of the game and just had three wide open threes and none of them went in. That was annoying. And then I, I'm forgetting the last loss. I, I forget, but it's just one of these things where this is a team that took home court seriously. And we'll see if that plays into the playoffs. You know, we talked about developing good habits um, but that's something that I've been I've been looking for the at home dominance and if they're going to have home court throughout the entire playoffs it's good to have home court in a place where you didn't lose really this season so you know yeah we can the last couple of weeks have been kind of tough just because you knew where Boston was you knew that they could kind of like take their foot off the gas pedal a little bit towards the end of the year and coast into the playoffs which is what you want you want guys to be healthy but at the end of the day you're looking for good habits they might have and we'll get to this, I think, in a little bit here with Jared, but they might have found something here with Porzingis at the end of games. He's talked a little bit about ramping up. He did this last night post game about ramping up, you know, making sure that his body is ready for, for the postseason. And I'm sure everybody else is holding themselves in the same, you know, standard as KP is. All the stuff that you that you want to hear after games, people are saying. And, and, you know, this has been sort of coughing like a six-month dance here. Okay, it's just – it, everybody is ah, who cares about the regular season nobody really cares it's all about the playoffs well, we're almost there folks we're almost there this is the toughest stretch i think personally it's just like the all right we can get this over with now we're finally here well while in the meantime there are certain little things we can poke at but uh you know last night's game as jared said i'm not taking really anything away from that oh and the fact that kp looks fantastic that was about it well i have take us there getting to kp well all right so the end of game struggles are one thing, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. But the one thing I'll say, Jared, and I've had this conversation with a couple of people already just throughout the day, the past couple of days. Is this basically what you were expecting from Chris Tapp's Porzingis when the trade was made this entire season? Or has he been better or worse than you think? Because I'm I'm looking at the entire body work of Porzingis and what I thought he would be when he first came into Boston – and I got to tell you, he hit every check mark I was looking for. And then above that, he's been as good as you could possibly imagine. I had little, like not nightmares, but little memories in my head of watching Marcus Smart kind of like have his way with Chris Stapps pausing us a little bit as pausing us would catch it like at the nail or at the elbow. Marcus knew how to get into his body enough to bother that shot. That seems doesn't seem to bother him anymore. The passing has been tremendous. The shooting has been great. The spacing, the defense at the rim. I mean, he's been as advertised, if not more so, in my opinion. How about yours? I would say he's like 85th percentile of what he possibly could have been. As far as, so like the main reason they got him was the pick and roll game and working him out of the high post. And I think he's been 
pretty close to as good as you could have hoped for as far as just ha- his dynamic and two-man actions offensively and his ability to stretch the floor and all that. That's been pretty much as they could have hoped. On offense, I think the only thing that's been a little bit lacking is they don't use him in the hard role as much as I would have expected. They don't get to that like deep post entries, the lobs, quite as much as I thought that they could have. And I'm not even sure why, because they they do do it pretty well, just not as much as I expected. They don't get him to the low block as much as I thought they could. They don't have they don't they don't very often have second units where the whole offense is just enter it to him on the low block. They like they do it a different a decent amount. A lot of it's more in the kind of mid to high post area and not as much way down there where he like really commands a double. And then I think just the other thing is they don't they don't do that to make him a passer. They don't run a ton of like, you know, rub actions where they'll have a cutter come like right up against where he's posting up and then it draws a double and then he can drop off stuff like that. They do it every once in a while. Like they don't do a ton of high low with him where they get him the ball in the post and then somebody flashes underneath the rim. These are all things that you've seen them do and they certainly do it a decent amount. I just thought that they would do it more than we've seen. And I don't know if that's just because there's several other great players that they run the offense through or what exactly that is. But I thought he would be, I thought they would use the full range of his ability and especially, especially his post passing ability more. And it seems like a lot of the time when he passes out of the post, it's really kind of just, he's in the mid post, you know, kind of just outside of the paint, a little bit higher up towards the free throw line, a team doubles and he just kind of makes the easy pass to the three point line and they swing it around. Not as many backdoor cutters and kind of stuff like that. Not as many complicated actions as I could have imagined that they would do, or at least I envisioned them doing before the season started. And I think probably part of that is also that their offense is a little bit more simplified. Like their offense, a lot of the time can be just find a mismatch, post up that mismatch, everybody's faces around it. And that, overall free-flowing nature i think has allowed them to kind of overall have the kind of offense they want but then sometimes limits them a little bit in how creative they can get and so generally that hasn't been an issue maybe it'll be a bit more of an issue in the postseason but offensively he's been like as far as utilization and range of possibilities for creativity it's been like an a minus his actual performance has been like a 94 out of 100 like it's been really really good it's about as good as you could have hoped for without like fully maximizing potential and then just on defense um his execution a lot of the drop stuff and ice stuff that they do is good but it's not like incredible it's very it's I shouldn't say good it's very very good like he's he just some, sometimes the angles he takes are a little bleh um, he gives guys a little more space than I think he should, and then they're able to shoot over him, stuff like that. And then they haven't used him as a switcher as much as they could, but they've kind of started to roll that out more, and we'll see how much they use that in the playoffs. But frankly, like you, you mentioned him talking about ramping up. That was I was asking him a question in uh, on Wednesday night about how his rim protection has been amazing lately. And I was I asked him and I asked Joe, like, is that just that – he's been parking more near the rim lately. So he's getting a ton of stops or is it getting better? And and especially KP was basically like, I'm kind of just like, I'm ramping up now. Like I'm playing harder and it's going to look even better. So it'll be really interesting to see in the postseason how much his intensity level on defense takes a, like a jump. What do you imagine these last half dozen games look like? And, and just to give people an idea, there are five at home of the six, the one road game in Milwaukee. Who knows if stars even play in that one as much as you'd like to think it's going to be Tatum Brown against, you know, Giannis and Dame. Who knows? And, I mean, it's just that, that Bucks thing, it's a whole other thing, especially with the comments made by Doc Rivers last night throwing, you know, everybody under the boss. I mean, that man just – it's it's unthinkable the uh even criticizing the travel crew and, and people not taking road games seriously it's it, he he does no wrong doc but you have sacramento portland uh new york charlotte washington mostly bad teams down this stretch here of the regular season that are going to be at the garden and so you know what percentage of these six games do you think we see everybody out there versus a rotation of guys that are sitting out maybe even that regular season finale is a full on you know red claws call up uh situation and uh, or i guess main celtics now no longer the red claws yeah, we, and we uh, the red you claws. know 
Yeah, I did. <laughs> long live. It's still the, the Sears Tower and it's still Staples Center. Exactly. Uh, or, you know, the experimentation on the floor in terms of rotations, in terms of, you know, just the way that, like, we've seen Missoula play with Porzingis a little bit of late in terms of how he uses him defensively and on what caliber of player and size of player that uh, he goes against. You know, things that, oh, you know, we haven't done as much of this in the regular season. We may see more of it in the playoffs. We're going to work on this. How much of working on things do you think is going to happen in these next couple weeks? Yeah, these games should not be real. Um, it, it should be all BS. It should be, they, like, they should be resting the vast majority of their starters in most of these games. O'Shea Brissett should be taking the ball up the floor. Steve McKaylick should be playing the five. Like they, they should be, they should be messing around. I would say don't, don't play Jordan Walsh because the main like has a real chance to win. And frankly, I think it's better for Jordan Walsh if he just wins with Maine and tries to get and tries to get the G League championship and give him that level of experience. Like that's where he should be playing. I think JD Davison's ankle injury. I can't remember if he's playing or not, but I'd imagine he's probably just going to sit out and stay with the team. So it's like give the main guys their championship and just build, you know, focus on them contending there and staying with that team. You don't need to develop them in these last few games. So they should be starting the end of bench guys. They should be giving Peyton Pritchard significant responsibility. They should be having Sam Hauser running some pick and roll and like doing a lot of playmaking off the catch. They, they should be playing Xavier Tillman and Luke Cornett a lot in like figuring out who's going to be getting those first round matchups. Cause they're probably going to need one of those guys a little bit in the first round if they especially like what if they end up with philly or something like that you're going to really need xavier tillman for that series so i would ramp those guys up give your main guys some rest i mean for god's sakes jalen brown needs to stop playing a lot of minutes you need to i mean you gotta like the main guys aren't going to just sit out the rest of the time like they need to stay they need to stay in rhythm you got to play them a little bit um Honestly, if I'm Joe, I'm bringing JT and JB off the bench, and I'm just messing around just to do weird stuff and experiment and all that. But you look at who they have left, it's like, all right, Sacramento's playing for something. They're trying to get out of the play-in. Milwaukee, they've got a slight lead on the East. What do they have, like two games or something like that on Cleveland? Um, a game and a half on Cleveland. Um, what's really interesting is New York, they have one more game left against New York. New York is kind of fighting for home court in that first round series. And with Julius Randle out for the year now and OG Ananobi, who knows if he's going to be back like New York, sadly is in a really tough spot, which is such a shame because frankly, they were the second best team in the East this year when they were fully healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and they, that, that second, a second round series against New York would be amazing. Also, I just don't feel like going to Orlando. I'd rather go to New York in the second round, assuming it's how it plays out. Um, but so you know, the, most of these games are going to be against teams that are tanking. I mean, Charlotte just announced that Clifford is stepping down. It's like, I don't think they're trying to win games at this point necessarily. I think they're just trying to fool around. Although I guess if I'm Steve Clifford, I'm probably trying to get whatever win I can before I maybe am forced into retirement. So, mm -hmm. you know, th these games, it's just a lot of tanking teams and teams that are just kind of like, you have no idea what they're going to do. But I assume the Bucks are going to play their guys in that one to solidify the two seed and get home court advantage in the second round. Didn't they play their guys at the end of the season um, two years ago or last year? I forget when that was exactly. Remember that being a little contentious. There was there was the 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 ducking the Nets particular yeah. portion of the season two years ago that got so two little, years ago. Yeah, they got a little nuts, and it was like you know. You know, I don't know why you're, you know, everybody made a big deal out of it in Boston, swept in four games, although all of them were close. So let's just throw that out there. It wasn't like they, that was a tough sweep. That yeah, they didn't sweep. kill them, but it was, it was a sweep. So it didn't really end up mattering. So yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it doesn't, for me, if you're looking at it from a Celtic standpoint, Jared, it's like, you know, who cares what the Bucks do? Because they're probably going to get, I'm not a big Cleveland guy. I don't know where you're at on that. I'm, I, I like some of their parts. I don't love the way the team functions in total. Um, and I do feel with you about the Knicks, but it's just like one of these things where, you know, let, can we stop Jalen Brown from hurting his hand before we get into the postseason here? Because this is two years in a row of this, and I'm just getting kind of sick of it, to be honest with you. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Prize picks is so easy to play. I can make my Celtic picks and make my entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals and easy gameplay and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what makes Prize Picks the number one fantasy sports app. 
Celtics and NBA fans, you can get in on prize picks in 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. On prize picks this week, I'm selecting Jason Tatum to dish out more than five assists and his teammate Jalen Brown to have more than 22 and a half points. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Prize picks. I was going to say, I mean, as far as the Cavs go, they've barely been healthy for a couple months. So it's, it's hard to even really judge who they are and what they're going to be. Uh, the Brown thing, for sure. I mean, it just and, and this is just universal as far as Boston goes, and, and any fan of their team would say the same thing. Let's just enter the playoffs healthy, see where things go from there. I know it's more physical. I know guys, you know, play harder, if you will, have a tendency to get more banged up, but just stay healthy, stay available, and we know what this team is capable of. And, and to that end, Jared, this is something Evan and I were talking about a little while ago. So I, you know, just scrolling social media be it uh you know twitter instagram whatever i i have come across now multiple new jason tatum commercials that i had not seen there was the watch commercial that you know that that one i think is a couple weeks old and then i just saw for the first time a new Jumpman commercial obviously for his sneakers we know he's done you know subway and various like doritos or chips or whatever else among other things i mean he has to be i don't I didn't look this up, so I, I I can't say this as a certainty, but it feels like, and Ev mentioned this earlier, it feels like he is, as far as American-born NBA players, the guy who is in the most advertisements right now. He is the face as far as the NBA goes. Do you believe that, you know, I, I know the NBA doesn't quote fingers, like root for any specific team to win a championship, but how much would the league do you think like to see Boston, a marquee franchise that hasn't won in a while, obviously, but with Tatum, who is, you know, perennially now in the MVP conversation, he's not going to win. He shouldn't win, but he's a guy that gets that attention. He's, you know, he'll, the talking heads will, will discuss him and his candidacy and all of that for years to come as they have been for a couple of years already. He's a, a first team, all NBA guy each and every year. And now he's getting the gigantic contract record setting this coming off season how much would the league like tatum and the celtics to win a championship sure david stern is pulling some strings right now from the grave to make it happen <laughs> right uh can they get a Celtics lakers final uh, i'm sure they're still rooting for it yeah. uh yeah i mean sure of course they want I'm, I'm sure the league office would love for tatum to be the one that comes out just because it gives him the real national star turn, gives him more of an international star turn as well. He is now like a key sneaker face. He like the, the last year or so his, his branding has really kind of taken off where he's got multiple endorsement deals. He's basically the face of Gatorade, basically the face of Jordan brand right now. Um, and he's in one of the biggest markets and he's a package deal, right? Like he comes with Deuce and Deuce, Deuce has some juice. He really does. Like people love Deuce, at least on the internet. I think he actually is a real draw for sure. And he's going to be in Jordan commercials, I assume at one point, if, if he hasn't already, I can't even remember. Um, but yeah, I mean, JT is definitely becoming like a top five face in the league right now as, as like the older faces start to kind of slowly phase out. So sure, of course they would want that. Yeah, people bring up the American thing. Um, I think Tatum probably has more juice in America than like a Luca, um, than you know, certainly than like Jokic and Embiid, who just aren't really at, you know, aren't really marketed at a prime level. Uh, Giannis is like someone who I think people tend to leave out of the conversation. I feel like Giannis is still one of the biggest faces of the sport, and he. You know, unlike JT, Giannis really, really shines in the branding spotlight. Like he's got a huge smile on his face. He mm -hmm. he brings a ton of charisma and energy. And he I think he's been kind of the ideal guy to be the face of the league because he really loves being in front of people and being in front of the cameras while JT is very introverted. And it's like, you know, I mean, he's a, he's certainly grown and improved, but he's a very introverted person. And so that's where the quandary, I think, comes to the league is like, do you want your main american star at this point so far because like obviously Ann edwards is coming for that and edwards is one of the most charismatic players i've seen in my time in the league as is Giannis. um and, and a successful you know, and, actor too 
Yeah, but Ant has so much MJ to him, right? Like his game looks exactly like MJ's. His swagger is similar to MJ's, even kind of looks a little bit like MJ. Like he has that MJ it factor. And that's why I think if he ever like wins at a high level, he'll probably be that guy. But also his shoe is incredible. Although I've actually warmed up the JT shoes. I actually like his shoes. But Ant's that first shoe is just amazing. Adidas knocked it out of the park. But so I think with JT, it's like, yes, they want, they, they're obviously the league would like to have at least like one American player who, you know, is competing at like that, that has the championships is at that top, top level. Um, just because it's like easier to market him to middle America probably. And, but I, I, but the point I'm making is I think it's overblown the whole American thing. It's like Giannis is, Giannis is from Greece, but he is as charismatic and enjoyable uh, and re- as relatable of an athlete as possible and i think it's just kind of showing maybe the rest of the country like we're all from the massachusetts area right so we're kind of used to diversity and we're used to global diversity and all that kind of stuff so i think like that's something that we come to expect while i think marketing to like middle america and like other parts of the country it's you know it's maybe a little bit harder of a sell so um i, I think at the end of the day it's like the nba is in great hands right now with um with Giannis and with Ant coming in. But when you have, it's really about just the person's personality. And it's like JT, Luca, Jokic, these guys are real introverts and they don't sell. Like they don't try to be a part of selling the, you know, with their, their personality and like being engaging and fun in the way that guys like Ant and Giannis and Embiid do. And so, yeah, I, I forget where I was going with all this because we're kind of lost in it. But Boston, big star that's a plus that's a win for the nba for sure yeah i mean ratings wise you're you're seeing what um important stars in prime time do with caitlin clark and in, in iowa i mean like what was it 12.3 million people watched that game and it was again you know what a lot of Plus people ryan Rosillo, and then you're not into it that uh, was that's yeah, tough what... I what is I replied to a friend of mine who tweeted that what what was he talking about there like Ryan Russillo saying that he turned the game off it's like that listen okay if you're one of those people it's like I don't want to watch women's athletes and like whatever I guess you can't really be sold on it I thought that game was amazing it was awesome and it was I an amazing game away. yeah it's like if you can get over the fact that they're not dunking and just like a pre like I mean I'm an X and O's person so I so it's like the women's game honestly from an X and O standpoint is more interesting a lot of the time now because of how simplified the NBA, NBA game has become. And the whole time I'm watching that first half with, with LSU and Iowa, I'm screaming at the TVs. I'm like, why are you in drop coverage on Caitlin Clark? So it's like, for me, it was a fascinating X's and O's experience. So I, yeah. I love that game. I didn't know like the end of the game slogged on, but the whole time I'm like, I can't believe LSU was continuing to fight and stay in this. So I, I loved it. It was, that was one of my favorite games of basketball I've watched like all year um that wasn't like a down to the wire kind of game and for me it's as someone who doesn't watch a lot of women's basketball just because like i don't really watch much basketball outside of the nba that's like that takes up most of my time i don't i don't even know i honestly don't even know who's in the final four at this point like as far as players are concerned uh caitlin clark and angel reese are probably the only two athletes i think i know that are currently that or i guess angel got eliminated but um like that game had star power and it had interesting strategic elements to it and uh kim mulkey is like the most entertaining coach i've ever seen uh like her outfits are wild her antics are wild like it's fun to watch she's insane i can't yeah. tell if i'm rooting for her or against her i have no idea but like <laughs> that's what makes it fun so i mean that game was like that if if you're trying to get sold on watching women's uh basketball like i feel like that game is the perfect selling point you're either going to accept it or you're not i guess but that was a well, fun and game. just the well, i mean a little segue on this because what the hell we're a basketball show we don't have to be just Celtics or just men or just nba or anything else as far as caitlin clark goes and and yeah like i'm not a gigantic consumer of women's basketball be it the w or college level but you know everybody at this point in time knows the Caitlin Clark story and you know there aren't too many of her games that I have watched in full this one you know I was I one I was invested in it I bet on it but I you know was you know I wanted to see like all the hype surrounding again Clark versus Reese in this matchup and so I I wanted to watch this thing and you know it it just what what stunned me I don't know if maybe you know more than I do in this respect so you weren't a surprise but what stunned me watching this thing was everybody knows there are commercial ads about it like we know caitlin clark's range and we've all seen the highlights and we know that she's just an absurd shooter and 
you know, going back to the all-star break, the the conversation of let's get her and Sabrina and the all-star game next year, not the game, but the three point contest against Steph and Dame or something like that. Like it's, you know, cause she obviously projects to be in the WNBA at that point, number one overall pick all of that, but watching this game, what I certainly didn't know. And I realized the diehards of, of women's college basketball are well aware, but I am not that. I mean, I had no idea that her playmaking ability was at such a high level. I mean, That's obviously great. I knew she could shoot, but the passing was like out of control. Her ability to set up her teammates, it, like she's she's not this one trick pony that I feel like she sort of gets advertised as. It, it, it was, it, I thought that was as compelling as anything else. One thing that I think was really fun about watching her is that you know, a lot of the time in the NBA, it's like you got you got other got guys like Luka and Jokic who basically just kind of sit back and then just make absurd plays. Or you have like a JT, for instance, who is someone who's really good at deep driving kicks. And like that's something he's really improved at. And watching her, it was honestly a little like it felt like a bit of a throwback in that I was seeing her kind of running pick and roll and then throwing really early pocket passes to the roller and stuff like that. And it was just cool to watch kind of more of the traditional pick and roll style that we had maybe 10 years ago before or like the game kind of got to the evolution where it is now where she was just making a lot of really early passes and for me like that's the part that's really interesting for me it's not so much the i'm going to drive super deep and then i'm going to be able to make that you know like kick out or i'm going to hang in the air and make that kick out it's like can i get over a screen and then pass ahead of into a space where a teammate's about to enter into as opposed to just like finding a stationary shooter and that's the stuff that i think is really really fun to watch because that's where it's like this person is one like taking a risk and two the team is on such a string that they're just throwing that pass hoping that that cutter is going to be there like that stuff you don't see as much in the nba anymore just because of everything either being collapsed post up like boston suing or real spread out five out stuff or like dunker spot stuff where it's like you just drive and then you draw two two and then you drop it off so like there's a lot of that kind of stuff in there that i think is the stuff that's really interesting you don't even see as much in the nba anymore well, Ev, I'm a big narrative street guy, so I'm eager to bet on Caitlin Clark in Iowa to beat UConn after she talked about how all she dreamt about when she was younger was playing for the Huskies, and they didn't even give her the time of day. So I, I'm I, I'm all about the uh, what the, how ugly this could potentially look in the next game. Oh yeah, I mean, I it, it she's been box office all year. This tournament has been literally one big buildup to see how far she would go. She's delivered, no question. Uh, no disrespect to LSU. They were tremendous. Angel Reese, and it, she was dominating that game to start and then got hurt, and then she was in foul troubles. I think it wasn't a, a real uh, uh, good barometer of how good of a player she is, and some of the stuff that's come out afterwards is disgusting. Uh, not really not really down for that. Um, but I, it's it's been fun to watch. And, and, you know, between Juju Watkins, I thought one of the best games of the tournament was Baylor-USC. That was a tremendous game. And it came down like the last couple of minutes in the fourth quarter, but it was basically a two-point game the entire game. Um, I, I almost feel a little bad because I was so close. I'm, I live an hour outside of Albany, so mm. I could have gone to see Kalen Clark, but it like was like $500 get-in price for the first couple of games. And then the LSU $500? Yeah, the LSU game was awesome. out. Yeah. The get-in price was outrageous. Just gonna tell you, um, I I did consider. My dad and I were like, you know, Caitlin Clark's like only an hour. We should definitely go. And we're like, uh, all right, well maybe not. Those are a little, those are a little steep. That's like, a that's an unfortunate but good sign that women's college basketball is doing pretty well if they're playing in Albany and they're still selling tickets for that insane of a price. So they were. It was harder. It was more expensive to go to like any Caitlin Clark game than most of the tournament games on the men's side this year. I'm just going to be flat out about sure. that. That's going to rather she watch her play the though. NBA next year and makes a fraction of what she'd make staying in college, but uh, you know that's. The, the the reality of the game and the sport and everything right at least she can get that five million dollar payout going and playing a you know 10 games in the big three over the summer so there's there's that but uh hey real quick before we do sign off you know we we mentioned obviously the women may as well touch on the men uh so 
UConn's a powerhouse. I, I think we all know that at this point in time. The Huskies really should make it back-to-back -back for the first time since Al Horford's Florida Gators back in 06-07. But they've got uh, this upcoming battle with a, another offensive powerhouse juggernaut in Alabama, but not nearly the defensive team that the Huskies are. On the other side, Zach Eady and Purdue against uh, DJ Burns and NC State, DJ Horn as well. Um, you know, betting-wise, for anyone that cares about that, I mean, one, I've, I've had a UConn futures ticket for a while, so give me the Huskies, but I'm on UConn to cover in this game. I actually like NC State with the points. I, I saw it. It's nine and a half, ten right now. I think NC, this, this has just been, Jared, I don't know how closely you've been paying attention to the tourney, but NC State has been just such a fun story, obviously, from, you know, getting the automatic bid, doing the Kemba Walker, UConn winning five games in as many days to win the ACC. And then this run they've gone on the tournament and, you know, no, they, they're not going to beat Purdue as an 11 seed. It's not going to happen. You know, we'll get that UConn Purdue matchup that everybody wants in the final, but I think the Wolfpack can keep it close. And that's, that's enough for me to be entertained. I hope you're not sending it to me because I have no idea what's going on. It's you should watch matter. this stuff. You'd like I will. UConn. I UConn's will. Gonna, UConn's gonna roll. It ain't gonna matter. Yeah, they're, I mean, I'm rooting. I'm always rooting so for good. the underdog, so I'd like to see NC State win. But sure. I, wait, NC State's in the Final Four for both, right? Yes. Yeah, so that would be cool to see a Cinderella win for both. I don't know. If I think at the Mecca so. Okafor and Diana Taurasi last time that happened. I'm pretty sure the that, irony, the irony that the UConn would have to go down for both of those. That'd be cool. I mean, sure. yeah, I'm a new, I'm a New Englander, so I'd love to see UConn win. I guess, but. Um, I thought you were going to say, I, I'm a New Englander, so college sports doesn't matter to me. Well, that too. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's I mean, true. listen, I went to BU. I grew up, I mean, shout out to BC. Uh, yeah. Part of the reason why I just like, enjoy watching women's game is when I was a kid, uh, the BC women's team would give tickets to my elementary school. So when I was really young, I would go watch their games. And it was, I had a great time. So, um, and I was three feet tall. So everybody looked tall to me back then. So, you know, that was, yeah. <laughs> still I, uh, I'm barely above three feet now. Yeah, so unless BC's involved, I probably or if shit, if BU is involved, I would be all about it. But I don't think we're, I don't think my uh, my terriers are getting anywhere near that anytime soon. So believe it or not, this was a Celtics podcast. Uh, C's are back at it on Friday tomorrow as we sit here right now. Game uh, at home against the Kings shouldn't be too compelling, but who knows? Some of these games go go a little wonky. We saw what happened in Atlanta, obviously. So uh, you got the Kings and the Blazers to take you through the weekend. We'll be back with you next week at some point in time, and we're just inching closer to a playoff preview uh, in probably means next week we'll we'll start to dive into potential first round matchups and seeding and all of that good stuff but one thing we do know jared and evan is that boston firmly planted atop the nba in the standings and hopefully come banner raising time in a couple of months as well for evan valenti for jared weiss i am adam kaufman check out jared's work in the athletic we didn't have time to get to it but a great piece on a conversation with grant williams about what a miserable effing teammate he is and terrible person so you should make sure you check that out and uh we'll talk to you again next week